Well, hey, guess what time it is? Jesus, stop. Stop. It's that wonderful time again. Quick movie reviews. Been a while-ish, I think. I can't remember. When was the last one? Anyway, yeah, welcome to quick movie reviews. Uh, if you don't know what it is, pretty self-explanatory. We review movies quick. So these are basically just the movies that I don't have all that much to say about, but still have a little something to say about. Just ones that I don't really want to dedicate a whole video to or anything, and yeah. Uh, there is seven, as always, and they go in order of when I saw them, so the earliest one is the earliest one that I saw. So, up first we have A Nightmare on Elm Street. Me and my friend have been having over-the-phone movie nights lately, because he lives in a different country than me, so we just call each other and watch a movie at the same time. At this point in time, we had only done it four times. We were meant to be watching movies that we knew were gonna be shit, and we basically just planned to laugh at them and all that. But after we watched Veronica, I think we were both changed men, and I think we needed something not shit. There's a short written review on Letterboxd for Veronica if you're interested, because there is no way I'm giving that movie publicity on YouTube. That movie is honestly probably the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. But since it was Halloween month when we watched this, we figured it would be cool to watch some older horror classics that my friend has seen before, but I haven't. Halloween, the movie, was recommended to me by this dude quite a while ago, and personally I wasn't that big of a fan, but I do see the appeal. And honestly, I was really expecting it to be the exact same thing with A Nightmare on Elm Street, where I would just not really get the big deal about it. But to my utter surprise, I was wrong. It's a great movie. It's one where I completely get why people love it and would still love it to this day. I think Wes Craven had such a great vision with this film. It seems relatively conventional, but there are really genuinely great twists and turns that had me going. Not only that, but the especially unique eye for horror imagery. Heaps of moments in this film are aesthetically fucking great. The bloodbed scene is so well filmed and fantastic. The roof scene, the design of Freddy Krueger, the phone scene, just to name a few. I really love how the imagery was approached. Yes, some of it is dated, but when you're watching and really invested in the film, it just feels so interesting and fun. I think the concept was great as well. It's executed wonderfully. Heather Langenkamp was a great protagonist in the film. And I gotta say, I have a massive crush on her now. At least in this film, because she's ridiculously gorgeous, my god. But yeah, acting-wise, she did great. And it was really great to see Johnny Depp's first role. He's pretty good in it. The one problem for me here is the ending, and it's a problem with a lot of people, I imagine, especially seeing as it wasn't actually what Wes Craven wanted to do. You can very much tell that as well, because it doesn't fit in well with the rest of the movie, and it's goofy as fuck. It's basically there to set up potential sequels, which I think is a really lame reason to shove it in there. It wasn't good at all. But everything up until then I found really enjoyable. And you can't really blame Craven for the ending. It just sucks that they did that. But it's a great film. As a horror, it did its job at freaking me out here and there. And in general, it's just sort of a very fun watch. So I'm gonna give A Nightmare on Elm Street a 9 out of 10. Up next we have Scream. Much like A Nightmare on Elm Street, this was another where me and my friend sat down and watched a horror classic that I hadn't seen, but he had and it happened to be another Wes Craven. I think I felt keen for this one because I knew enough about it, but also because I liked the last Wes Craven movie that I watched. The reason I knew some stuff about Scream is shameful. It's scary movie. Look, I'll admit it, when I was younger, I thought that that series of parody movies was the best shit ever. I even went so far as to enjoy epic movie and disaster movie. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, let me just, let me just say that. Which is, it's just shameful because sitting down and watching those movies today, I, I barely would crack a smile, honestly. <laughs> it's just the dumbest humour ever and it's not my thing anymore. But the first scary movie is like a parody of Scream, so yeah. Outside of that, I had no real knowledge of it. Even the fact that Scary Movie was a parody of a parody film. I didn't know that's what Scream actually was. So I felt sort of confused while watching it, but once I started to understand what it was all about and get a vibe for its endgame, it made more sense and I enjoyed it a lot more. The movie is about a teenage girl who is being terrorized by a local killer who torments her and her friends. Pretty basic plot, but that's the goal here. Given that A Nightmare on Elm Street 
Street was the only other frame of reference I had for Wes Craven. I didn't really expect this to be a film essentially making fun of stereotypical horror tropes, but it is, and it does so well at that. Neve Campbell is a great lead here. Her performance feels really genuine, even when surrounded by such ridiculousness in the writing, and I like that she makes it feel authentic and doesn't push it over the less believable edge. Skeet Ulrich was awesome. Matthew Lillard was hilarious. Awesome seeing Henry Winkler too. I will never be opposed to seeing something from him. He's great. <laughs> he was barely fucking in the movie. Why am I talking about Henry Winkler? Mostly really great acting all around though, yeah. I don't have a huge amount to say with Scream, partly because it's all been said in a much better way than I could right now. The gist of it is that the movie is pretty great. It does a brilliant job at being satirical, ridiculous, and scary all at once. It's one of those movies where I'm sure it would be even better on rewatches. It's very well presented, well shot, well directed, well acted. It takes you on a wild journey with the writing, <laughs> and it's honestly got one of the best endings ever. I don't absolutely love it yet, but yeah, it's a blast. What can I say? So I'm gonna give Scream an 8 out of 10. Up next we have The Trial of the Chicago 7. This is a odd one for me really, because while watching I was very engaged and enjoying a lot of what I was seeing, but man I kept forgetting that I even watched this. The main sell here was Aaron Sorkin. He wrote one of my favourite films of all time, The Social Network, and wrote and directed a absolutely fantastic film back in 2017 with Molly's Game, and after finding out some of the cast and finding out Aaron Sorkin was attached and gonna direct and all that shit, I was very much sold on this. The movie is about a trial that took place after an uprising at the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago, and it focused on these seven people that were on trial for various charges. If I were to pinpoint an issue with the film, I would say the later half. It starts off very strong, and the setup is great. The editing is fantastic, wonderfully paced, and it keeps you engaged as hell. Then as it goes, it drops off a lot of the energy that it had in the first half, and it becomes a lot more tedious. The biggest praise that I could give is the acting really, because it keeps the film moving really well. Even if it's not as interesting, you can still admire a lot of the dedication that's given. Sasha Baron Cohen being the obvious standout here. He gave a fantastic performance that managed to be equal parts hilarious and sincere. And even equal to him in acting, honestly, was Frank Langella. Holy Christ, that guy. I've always loved seeing him show up because I think he's a fantastic actor. And here he displayed a character that is so fucking villainous and despicable, which isn't how I'm used to seeing him, but he just did absolutely brilliantly at it. The other standouts being Jeremy Strong, Eddie Redmayne, John Carroll Lynch, Mark Rylance, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Michael Keaton, Yahya Abdul-Mateen II, and Kelvin Harrison Jr. The cinematography is also great, and yeah, as I said, I like the editing a lot in the first half of the movie, having that very fast-paced feel with a comedic edge. It's only the second film that Aaron Sorkin has directed, but he's written many, so I don't expect this to be his downfall or anything, and it's not a bad film. But it is a big step down from Molly's Game, I would say, which was just a infinitely more interesting true story that was handled really well. Another problem that I had with the movie was that it sets you up for a very interesting conclusion, but it feels like it goes for a more, like, wannabe, tear-jerking, sentimental kind of ending, and then it gives you a bunch of text about what happens after that scene. Like, I'd much rather they just play that out on screen screen rather than having me read it all. I don't know. It felt like it wanted to have this big emotional conclusion, but when it sets itself up to give clarity to the viewers at the end, you don't really want that. Maybe it worked for others, but yeah, not exactly for me. Overall, the movie is a letdown, but it's not a bad one. It's very forgettable to me, I guess. Don't know if I'll ever re-watch it, but I, I guess we'll see. <laughs> for now, this is how I feel. So I'm gonna give The Trial of the Chicago 7 a 6 out of 10. Up next we have hashtag alive. I don't know if you're meant to say the hashtag part or if you're just meant to call it alive and then do that maybe. I don't know. Good zombie content is really hard to come by. That's just a fact, I would say. Whether it be zombie comedies or dramas, you will likely find more bad than good. The last zombie movie that I watched before this was Peninsula, which also went into quick movie reviews, and was really underwhelming and could have been so much better. With Alive, I didn't really know anything about it other than it was a Korean zombie movie, which always sounds like a win, really. When it started to get into the swing of things, I was really invested, and then it started started to feel a little bit slower, and I basically just started to realise, oh, it's a bottle film. 
cool. And that's pretty cool, yeah. If you don't know what a bottle film is, it's basically just a saying for a film or episode of something that's all set in one place. So this movie is essentially about a guy stuck in his apartment during a zombie apocalypse, and he's a streamer. Cool concept, I would say. I would say there are definitely very noticeable pros and cons with Alive. Coincidentally, a few of the cons are actually the same ones I had with Peninsula. Maybe Korean zombie movies aren't as cool as I thought. The pros are absolutely great, though. The cinematography is fucking stunning for the most part. Tons of incredible shots and really nice lighting too. Some really pull you in with their framing and color grading and lighting and all that. Really pleasing to look at. As well as that, there's the acting, particularly from You Are In. I just, that just sounded like You Are In. I'm sorry if I mispronounce his name, I'm really bad with it. But he leads the film very well. I still haven't seen Burning or any other film with him, so I'm really not starting with the best, I'm guessing. I really do want to see that movie though. But either way, he's really good here. Park Shin Hye, she's really good as well. The scenes with the zombies had some genuinely great, really tension-filled moments. I think the direction taken with many of those scenes honestly worked out really well, and it was just generally fun to watch. My negatives come in, and as I said, this works for Peninsula as well, with a lot of the overly sentimental shit. Toward the end, it starts to fall off because it really starts to take itself way too seriously. No spoilers at all, but there's a big-ass dramatic scene with really cheesy slow motion and overly emotional music and it just doesn't work very well. Up until then we establish a connection with the two characters but it's not really anything that makes you feel super emotionally invested. As well as that some of the zombie sound effects are ridiculously over the top. I like the way they look but man can I get a second where I don't hear a zombie cracking its bones when it makes the slightest fucking movement? Like it's literally just like Look at my first reaction log on Letterboxd. Like, it's genuinely really over the top. With all that said, I think it's a competent movie for a while at least. It's fun, it has good action scenes and good tension-filled moments. Good acting and some moments did make me feel for the characters in a weird way. Overall though, it's not the most noteworthy zombie movie ever. Only really for how good it looks and it being really fun at times. I'd recommend it, but I don't think it's anything too special, so don't get your hopes up. So I'm gonna give hashtag alive a 6 out of 10. Up next we have The Midnight Sky. What the shit man. Why does George Clooney seem like such a wildly boring director? I've seen this, The Monuments Men and The Ides of March and they all just leave me feeling like they could have been so much more. <laughs> the Monuments Men to this day is probably one of the most fucking boring movies I've ever watched in my life. The Ides of March was very decent and I like the acting, probably the best film he's directed from what I've seen. The Midnight Sky though? God. <laughs> It's so many things. It makes two hours feel like three, I'll say that much. This is a movie that really drags itself out. If you don't know, The Midnight Sky is about a lonely scientist who discovers a girl left behind in his research station, and in desperation he makes an attempt to contact a space crew to stop them from returning to Earth due to a mysterious global catastrophe. I think the movie has a relatively strong start. It's very slow paced and it really took its time with scenes and it became somewhat engaging but it starts to become really muddled in the last hour and 10 minutes. Picking out the things that I would like I would say the main performances are decent. George Clooney is naturally a great actor and he's doing well even though it's far from his best. Good to see him in another movie at least since he had like a four year break. Hope there's better things to come but yeah he's good here. Felicity Jones is pretty much the same. It's good but far from her best. I like a fair amount of the cinematography. I think there's pretty good light choices here and there. The score is genuinely great, but that's to be expected from Alexandra Desplat. But that's really it. The cons massively outweigh the pros here. I think the performances outside of the main two are really forgettable and dull. Kyle Chandler is so fucking boring to watch. He's been on a losing streak with me with his performances lately. Game Night was the last great one and it wasn't even like that great. Kaolin Springull was fine for a first time child performance, but she barely said a word most of the time and pretty much had the same face for a, a good while of it, so eh. David Oyelowo was just whatever, honestly. You can see he's giving it a go, but his character is just so uninteresting. There's some very questionable 
visual effects too. My biggest problem is the script though really, as well as the pacing issues that it introduces, making the film drag way more than it should have. The movie is based on a book and it probably would be a decent one, but the way it's executed in film is just awful. There's so many things thrown in at the end just to make you feel like it's giving you twist after twist, but leading up to that it's like they just forgot about them and then just went, oh shit yeah, throw that one in there, and that one, and that one. Basically the start feels very slow and moody, then the long midsection feels slow for all the wrong reasons, like it goes back and forth from the spaceship and earth, and it doesn't feel like anything of importance is happening at all. Then the end is just jam packed with throwing shit at the wall, and that by the time the film was over I was just sitting there thinking, fuck what a waste of time. Like my god, it could have been done so much better. Also the credits are cringe as fuck. It's just two characters sitting next to each other pretending to operate a spaceship. And you can see the actors just look so awkward. Like what a bad choice, just have the credits like go to a black screen, don't do that. Ugh, it was so fucking awkward. <laughs> anyway yeah, it was a big letdown. Watch it if you want, but expect to be bored I guess. So I'm gonna give The Midnight Sky a 3 out of 10. Up next we have Paddington. Oh my god, I'd die for that bear. I would die for that bear. What a fucking cutie. I'm so glad my friend introduced me to this masterpiece. Basically lately we've just been watching like whatever we want to show to each other. It's not really, you know, classic horror movie or bad movie anymore. It's just Whatever, we'll watch whatever. I didn't really know much about Paddington before going into it, only that it's a really cute bear and it's a kids movie that adults seem to enjoy even more I guess. And that part is very right. Paddington is absolutely that kind of movie. If you don't know the plot or anything here, here it is. After tragedy strikes in the jungles of darkest Peru, a young bear named Paddington is sent to London by his Aunt Lucy to find a better life. In doing so, he discovers a nice family who take him in. Also, he's obsessed with marmalade. What makes the movie really special, I think, is the all-inclusive appeal that it's got going for it. It really is fantastic for kids and adults. You have a bunch of actors that adults would know, and a very noticeably British sense of humour, and a generally smart sense of humour that adults can laugh onto as well, but it's also got all the silliness and fun that you want from a kids film. Ben Whishaw does a superb job at voicing Paddington here. He just matches the mannerisms so well and has a infinite amount of wholesomeness to give out with his voice acting. It's adorable. Hugh Bonneville is hilarious in this as well. His character is so opposed to everything, but a lot of great comedy comes from that. Sally Hawkins is a incredibly warm and adorable presence here. I loved how passionately she performed as well. Julie Walters is hilarious hilarious in her scenes, especially one towards the end. Other big highlights were Peter Capaldi, Nicole Kidman, Jim Broadbent, Madeline Harris, Imelda Staunton, Michael Gambon, Samuel Joslin, and Matt Lucas. So many people I love in this. I think the story goes in pretty much any direction you can expect. Nothing really shocks you about that part, but it doesn't need to. It's how it's executed that's the best part. Plus the way the scenes are laid out are genuinely really creative and fun, as well as many moments just being laugh out loud hilarious and the characters not only being so true to their distinctive qualities, but also having noticeable arcs. What more could you want? Paddington is a ton of fun. It's not perfect, but it's just a joy to watch. If you haven't seen it, please go for it. If you're into this sort of humour, like these actors, and want to have a fun time where you can just turn your brain off and laugh, go for this. So I'm gonna give Paddington a 9 out of 10. And lastly we have Paddington 2. See when it comes to Paddington I had only really heard people talking passionately about the second one, never really the first. Which is a surprise though because I think the first one is great. But after seeing Paddington 2 it's sort of easy to get why. I think it has a lot of similarities to Wes Anderson's style of filmmaking and even the sense of humour feels that way a bit. Following after the first Paddington it translates well but has a new approach stylistically. And honestly more of an emotive story. The story here is that Paddington wants to get a present for his aunt Lucy when she comes to visit London, but a thief steals the present and when Paddington attempts to catch the thief, he is framed and lands himself in prison. And then him and the Brown family must figure out who stole the present. With that, it immediately feels different. We're not just watching Paddington up to his usual shenanigans, along with the Brown family, or anything that feels more or less normal. No, that little fucker is in the slammer! So I like that it had a normal enough setup with that plot point there. Makes things interesting. Once again, every returning actor here is doing so well. Ben Whishaw keeps being fucking adorable as Paddington. I'll say it again, 
I would die for that fucking bear. You feel so attached to him when you're watching it. Gosh. In terms of new actors that weren't in the last film though, there are two absolutely massive standouts. One being Hugh Grant, who I genuinely love seeing whenever he pops up lately. Between this and The Gentleman, it makes me appreciate him a lot. He doesn't do movies all that often lately, but man, he's just so charismatic and enjoyable to watch and can fit into so many different roles. Really do want more from him because he's just so good in this. And my personal favorite from the film, really, mostly because I just can't stop loving him as an actor, Brandon fucking Gleason. I love this man. So so much. He is my Paddington Bear. He, like, he's just a big boy that can act so well. He's always so lovable. I just, I want to give him a big hug. I love that guy so much. Anything he's in, he just commits himself. He's easily one of the most underrated actors out there, and he has so much to offer. Here, he is absolutely hilarious and equally intense, playing a man called Knuckles, who is a prison chef with his name misspelled in tattoos across his face. <laughs> Is. Like, fuck yeah, that's what you want. He's so good in this. Like I said, the movie does feel very Wes Anderson-esque, but plenty of the fun, silly humour there to keep children entertained as well. The comedy is pretty much always so well done. But what I was taken aback by was how emotive it can be. The opening is heartwarming enough to give you a good kickoff, but the overall sentimental approach, especially with Paddington and his love for Aunt Lucy, is beautiful. The ending? made me cry. Straight up fucking cry. Tears were flowing down my face. I think it's a mix of how good the voice acting is and how wholesome and heartfelt the story can be. But yeah, it actually got to me. And this is Paddington, the bear who's just fucking obsessed with marmalade. Like my god, why is it doing these things to me? <laughs> anyway, yeah. Paddington 2? Kind of perfect. For what it's supposed to be, it succeeds massively. It's heartfelt, it's hilarious. It's well acted and it's heaps of fun. What more could you want? Watch Paddington 2 and Paddington 1, but yeah, watch Paddington 2, fuck me. So I'm gonna give Paddington 2 a 10 out of 10. So, what did you think of these movies? Did you watch them? Did you like them? Let me know down below and please check out my links down in the description. And also, if you're wanting to see my reviews for the movies that I put like even lower than quick movie reviews where I just have like a paragraph or whatever to say, check out my letterbox. Here's an example of one I did for Veronica if you want to read that. Also, do not fucking watch that movie. But yeah, go on my letterbox if you want to see that or if you want to know what I think about a film, then just look it up. And if you're following me, then my rating or my review should come up. And yeah, you'll know. And if you have any suggestions of things for me to watch, then please put them in the comments and I'll add them to my massive watch list. And if you did enjoy this video, then please subscribe. It really, really helps me. And thank you as always for watching. I respect your opinion and I hope you have a great day. And bye.